historical setting. And um, it's quite a, it's one, it's a book I've really enjoyed writing. It's all about a boy who wants to grow up to be an executioner. <laughs> so um, as you can see, not, not, in not a complete shift away from what I'm normally doing. Uh, after this, after the fantasy book, I'm doing a four book series. I'm going to read you out a little extract from the first of those four books. I'm not going to say too much about it, except the scene I'm going to read out, it doesn't come from the very beginning of the book. It's about four or five chapters in. It's set, uh, set about 200 years ago, roughly, roughly speaking, and the main character in it is a young boy. In the scene I'm going to read out, he's running for his life. He's been chased by a mob of angry people, and if they catch him, they're going to kill him. I'm not going to tell you why, that will become clear when we read the books, but he's managed to um, give them, he's managed to lose them, he's managed to get away from them for the, for the time being. He's been running all day, it's raining, it's cold, he's starving because he hasn't eaten, night is falling. He knows he has to find shelter or he'll die of exposure to the elements. So he's been looking for a, an old shed or a, a tumble down old house, somewhere he can rest up, but there isn't anything, he can't find anything. Then he comes to a graveyard, and he spots a few crypts inside the graveyard. And he thinks, if he can get to one of the crypts, he can rest there for the night. Now, this is 200 years ago, so he's far more superstitious than people today are. He believes completely in ghosts and ghouls, magic, and all sorts of things. So the last thing he wants to do is spend the night in the graveyard. But he has to be practical. He knows he's either taking chances in the graveyard or die for definite outside. So he decides to go in. The graveyard was larger than the boy had imagined. He scrambled across the graves, muttering prayers to every god he never heard of, eyes cast low. He couldn't get into the first crypt that he tried. The doors were shield shut. There was a chain on the woven copper gates of the next crypt. He tugged at the gates as hard as he could, and the chain gave a little, but there wasn't enough space for even a small dog to squeeze through. The boy thought he heard movement behind him as he jerked on the gates. He stood shivering, head lowered, eyes shut, expecting an attack. But with nothing left out of the gloom, he backed up cautiously and hurried to the next crypt. He almost didn't try this door. It was on hinges and slightly ajar, but it was carved of stone, and he doubted that he had the strength to move it. A rain was lashing down, he was exhausted and freezing, so, with no real hope, he grabbed the edges of the door and pulled. It slid open so smoothly that he slipped and fell into the mud. Landing with a splash, he tensed and peered into the darkness of the crypt. Maybe it had opened so easily, because something inside had pushed at the same time that he pulled. But the boy couldn't see anything lurking within. So, with one last quick prayer, he got to his feet, wiped the rain and mud from his face, then ducked and entered the crypt. At first, he thought it was pitch black, but then he closed his eyes for a while, and when he opened them again, he found that he could see fairly well. He studied the crypt in closer detail, there were brick walls on either side, behind which a coffin rested. There was a strange, sort of ornamental fountain in the middle. No sign of any ghosts. Growing braver, he moved into the centre of the crypt. It was chilly and damp in here, but a lot warmer and drier than outside. His stomach rumbled and he winced. He was starving. He hadn't eaten since the night before. As he approached the fountain, he saw that it was covered in cobwebs. He studied the strands of spiders. He had eaten insect before when he was hungry, but they were either hiding or had moved on. With a sigh, he figured he might as well try the cobwebs. He doubted they'd fill him up. They might even make him sick. But he had nothing to lose. He ran a couple of fingers through one of the webs, breaking the strands. And he twirled his fingers around several times, adding to the webby covering. When it was thick enough to hide his flesh, he brought the fingers to his mouth and peeled off the webs with his teeth. He gagged, almost got sick, but then gulped and forced down the disgusting, dusty webs. He swiftly scooped up more, working his way down 
from the top of the fountain to the bottom. He kept looking for spiders or even a few dead flies, but no joy. Then, as he was sucking more of the strands from his sticky fingers, someone spoke from a spot high above and behind him. Ah, cobwebs are treat where you come from! The boy whirled defensively, eyes locking on the wall above the door, the one place he hadn't thought to check when he entered the crypt. Something was attached to the bricks. It looked like a man, but the boy was sure it wasn't. It was a red-skinned beast with a pale face and long dark hair streaked with white. Its claws were dug into the bricks and it was studying the boy with what looked like a wicked, bloodthirsty smile. The boy darted through the door, certain he was too late, that the creature would drop in front of him and block his way before ripping into him and tearing him apart. But to his surprise, the beast never moved, and a second later he was in the doorway, freedom just a couple of paces ahead of him. I would ask you to stay a while, the creature said, and something in its tone made the boy pause. He glanced upwards and saw that the thing had lowered its head. Only a handful of inches now separated their two faces. The boy squealed and slammed back into the jammer doorway. But still, he didn't spill out the crypt and run away. Because the creature hadn't sounded threatening when it spoke. It had sounded lonely. What are you? The boy gasped. Should not the question be, who? Am I? The creature asked, who released its grip, <coughs> dropped to the floor, and stood. The boy saw that it was actually a man, or at least it had the body and face of one. The red he had glimpsed was the material of the man's clothes, not his skin, which, from what the boy could see, was no different to any other person's. Uh, aren't you a monster? The boy asked, eyeing the man suspiciously. The man chuckled. I would not describe myself as one, although there are many who would. <coughs> then, to the boy's surprise, the man extended a hand. The boy's heart was pounding in his chest, but he didn't want to be impolite, so he stuck out a trembling arm of his own and shook hands with the man. And as he did so, for some bizarre reason, his sense of fear slipped away entirely, and he began to feel in some strange way, as if he had come home and was in the company of a friend. This crypt is my home for the night, the man said as they shook hands. You are more than welcome to share it with me if you wish. Thank you, the boy said weakly, as if in a dream. By the way, the man added, my name is Seba Nile. Yes. May I ask, what is yours? The boy gulped, then croaked. I'm Larton. Larton Crepsley. Yes. I bid you welcome, Larton, Seba said warmly. And without releasing the boy's hand, he led him back into the shadows of the crypt. And that's where Mr. Crepsley's life as a vampire began. Yes. <laughs> There will be four books all about Mr. Crepsley and his life before he met Darren. So it takes him from when he was a child up until when he met Darren at the Serpent Freak. It's a very long, tragic tale, full of treachery, heartbreak. We get to meet the loves of Mr. Crepsley's life. Aracel's actually was only one of three women in his life. And uh, we learn, we get to meet some new characters, we'll get to meet some characters we knew from the saga, like Bancha March, uh, Steve and I, obviously, as you heard there. It wouldn't even surprise me if Mr. Tiny put him in for appearance. So, we've got that to look forward to. As you can see, I won't be resting on my laurels. So it's going to be two books a year for at least the next three or four years. So, plenty more to come. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming here today. Uh, once I finish up here, I'm going to be moving outside. And I'll be happy to sign books if you've bought them from home. Uh, if you want to get buy books here, get them signed. Or if you just want a bit of paper signed, whatever, no problem. So, I hope to see you all again in a few minutes, just outside. Thank you.